Hello, I'm Carrie. Welcome back to Animal Farm. In this video, I'm going to be talking about chapter four. If you missed one through three, I will link them below. I'm going to do some summary and then a little bit of history and analysis. So check out the timestamps in the video notes. Uh, scroll down, click around, find whatever you need. All right, let's go. Chapter four. Farmer Jones has been having a rough year. Um, after he got tossed off of his farm, he has basically been posted up at the local pub, uh, kind of crying to anyone who will listen about how terrible life is and how horribly he's been treated. No one's really that sympathetic. Um, in fact, his neighbors, Farmer Frederick and Farmer Pilkington, are just kind of rolling their eyes behind his back and crossing their fingers that they can turn this whole situation to their own advantage. Meanwhile, the pigeons of Animal Farm have been making the rounds through the English countryside. They're teaching all the other farm animals beasts of England. Remember, that's like their their revolution theme song. It's like their anthem that talks about the republic of the animals. That's going to be this amazing animal paradise that happens once all the farm animals of England rise up together and overthrow the humans. Now, like all the other local farm animals are kind of getting the energy. They're liking this. They're liking the song. They're starting to push back against their own humans, check their limits. Well, the other farmers start to see this happening and they're like, you know what? We can handle this. We're going to spread a little information of our own. So they start spreading rumors about Animal Farm. All those animals are starving. They're cannibalizing each other. They're doing terrible, horrible things on that farm. Nobody really buys into it. Beasts of England just starts becoming more and more popular. It has gone viral. So the other farmers are like, all right, we got to shut this down now. Jonesy, get your gun, get your guys, let's get you back on your farm. So Jones heads back to the farm with his gun and like half a dozen dudes. They are ready to retake Animal Farm and put Jones back in charge. Snowball, however, has been waiting for this. He has been expecting Jones to try and retake the farm at some point and he is ready for it. He has studied, he has planned, he has trained the other animals, he's got a plan of attack, he's got battle stations set up, and he leads them in a counterattack against the humans. It's a huge success. The plan works. They drive Jones and the other humans off the farm completely, all over again. Massive animal victory. Way to go, Snowball. So the animals are all super excited. They have kicked the humans off the farm again. They're like high-fiving each other. Did you see that awesome thing I did? When all of a sudden somebody says, where's Molly? Remember our friend, the carrot horse Molly? Uh, everybody freaks out for a second. Is she hurt? Is she kidnapped? What's gone on? Uh, turns out she's just hiding in the barn. Um, she was not really digging the whole battle thing. She's not really feeling the let's die for animal farm thing that Snowball is advocating. She's not, uh, she's not a real passionate revolutionary. So Molly's been hiding out in the barn. No big deal. They go back to celebrating. They even come up with an award, a medal. They call it Animal Hero First Class. And they give it to Snowball, who led the attack and who was also wounded in the attack. They also give it to Boxer, who, no surprise here, was like the bravest, strongest, most terrifying fighter on all of Animal Farm. They also come up with a second award called Animal Hero Second Class that's given to a sheep who was killed by Jones during the battle. They call the whole incident the Battle of the Cow Shed. End chapter four. All right, so now that I have gotten the sun out of my eyes, let's double back and do a little bit of history and analysis. So chapter four starts with the pigeons making the rounds through the English countryside, teaching everybody beasts of England. This is a reference to something that the early Bolsheviks did. So they pulled off the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in 1917. But a lot of the people that were involved, including Leon Trotsky, didn't think that the revolution should end there. They were really picturing like a worldwide communist revolution and Russia was just going to be like the epicenter of it all, like the hub, the homeland of all this communist activity. So they started reaching out uh, to other countries, um, were reaching out to the working classes there to encourage them um, to rise up and have their own revolution. You know, they were communicating. They were like, hey, let us tell you what we've been doing in Russia. Let's help you get organized. Let's get you going. Let's work together. Let's communicate. The other European governments weren't really here for it. They were kind of like, um, we are not welcoming you here. We are 
not interested in any revolution today. We won't be buying. Please leave. We don't want to hear from you. In fact, if you're a fan of British TV, um, I've been watching Downton Abbey. I also recently started Peaky Blinders. I know I'm way behind, but whatever. Um, but the early episodes of both of those shows feature characters that are involved in working class politics and either have uh, sympathies with the Russian revolutionaries or are getting direct support from them. And the other characters, especially those of the wealthier classes or those who are involved in government or law enforcement, are extremely suspicious of these characters. Uh, they're not trusted, not well liked, just openly hostile to people that were interested in Russian politics at that time. So yeah, Downton Abbey, here for the history. All right, so that's what the pigeons are a reference to. Now let's talk about the battle. Chapter four is pretty short. It's very straightforward. This is how it happened. Not a lot of hidden meaning or symbolism there. And it's really got Snowball as the star of the show. You know, it was his plan. He led the attack. He was wounded. He was victorious. He got a medal from the other animals. He made the speech afterwards. It's really his show. This is, this is Snowball live on stage. Um, but we do get a pretty good picture of what everybody's doing during the battle. Uh, we know where Boxer is. We know where Benjamin is. We know where the sheep are, the goat. Um, we know where Molly is, and Molly's not even a central character. We know what Jones and Frederick and Pilkington are all doing. The one that we don't know where he is is Napoleon. Napoleon's name is not mentioned even once in chapter four. He does not show up. So why is that? Well, I have a couple of theories and like the conspiracy theorist in me is saying like Napoleon wasn't there. You know, he did the same thing that Molly did. And at the first sign of danger, he um, got out of there. He kept himself safe in a way and then slipped back into the celebration before anyone missed him. You know, after all, somebody called out Molly and like I said, conspiracy theory. There's no better way to cover up your own mistakes than by putting the spotlight on somebody else's. So that somebody who pointed out that Molly was missing, I kind of wonder if it was Napoleon or Squealer. So yeah, that's, that's conspiracy theory me um, making the rounds coming out to play. So there could be another reason that Napoleon does not appear in here and it's just the snowball show in chapter four. So... The Battle of the Cowshed takes place in chapter four. There are six more chapters in this novel and the Battle of the Cowshed is going to be brought up by someone at least four more times. They're going to tell the story of the Battle of the Cowshed. The story is gonna change a little bit every time. I think the reason it's so cut and dried, very focused on Snowball in chapter four is so we can see how much the narrative is going to change as the novel goes on. So at chapter four, Snowball's at a hundred and Napoleon is at zero. And every time this gets retold, Snowball's stock is gonna go down a little bit and Napoleon's stock is gonna come up a little bit. So they're gonna rewrite the history of Animal Farm as things go forward. Rewrite it specifically to make someone look a lot better than he did. His role in that battle is going to change every time the story is told. Uh, so yeah, they're rewriting the history of Animal Farm. You've probably heard people make jokes about revisionist history, like someone says their opinion on a particular historical figure and someone who disagrees is like, please, that's revisionist history, that's not real. Well, there actually is something called historical revisionism. Sometimes archeologists or historians bring forth new data, new evidence um, about a particular historical event or a particular person, and the history books have to adjust what they say because we have some new information that affects our conclusions about something. On a really small scale, um, like say your parents did not show up at your soccer game and you're mad they blew off your soccer game. You find out later that on their way to the stadium, there was a terrible wreck right in front of your parents and they had to jump out and give CPR to some people and they didn't make it to your game on time. Now that does not change the fact that your parents didn't show up at your game but it can change your conclusions about it. It's not that your parents didn't care about your game. It's not that they blew you off or anything like that. It's that um, 
something epic came up that they had to help out with. They had to interfere with. And that changes your perspective on what happened. Or it should. And if it doesn't, then you've got, you've got some issues. So that's historical revisionism. You adjust your perspective when you get new information. So historical revisionism has an evil twin and it's called historical negationism. So revisionism is where you get new facts so you have to alter your perspective. Negationism is you alter the facts because you're not going to change your perspective. Um, it's sometimes called denialism. If you've heard of Holocaust deniers, these are people that uh, ignore huge amounts of evidence, um, eyewitness testimony, physical evidence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in favor of their own conclusions. So one, uh, one aspect, so to say, of historical negationism is disinformation. That is when false information is spread and you know it's false. Like you're telling something, you're telling somebody something that is wrong, fully knowing that it's wrong. You're not accidentally spreading bad information. You are purposely spreading bad information. So that is what is going to happen in Animal Farm. They're going to rewrite history by shutting up the facts and promoting a false narrative, a fake story, fake news, so to speak. So I think that is why we see so much of Snowball and nothing of Napoleon in this chapter. It's so we'll notice when that story starts to change. All right, so that's all I have for you on this one. If I missed something or I went too quickly, something wasn't clear, drop a question in the comments. I will do my best and I'll see you in the next chapter.